entrepreneurship scholar. What does that define? What's the definition? You have of? to generate knowledge that other people don't yet have that they find useful enough to take and use when they act as an entrepreneur. It's kind of like um, an engineering scholar or an artistic scholar or, a, or an acting teacher or a finance scholar. You, it's not enough to use knowledge. You have to generate new ways of thinking and new collections of information that people can take away and use as knowledge as a tool for them to solve problems that they're dealing with. Okay. And, and so that, that's my definition of a scholar. And I never planned to be one professionally. The most influential person in my life was my mother. Um, I was very fortunate to be close to my mother and she was the kind of mom that, I mean, she's still around and I love her. Hi, mom. Um, who would give me questions to deal with. If I wanted something from the other kids in the neighborhood or from my brothers or something like that, she wouldn't go and try to get it for me. She would say, well, you're going to have to fight for that, aren't you, then? Mm -hmm. And if I believed in something strongly, she would say, well, it's not enough just to have this belief. You, you have a duty to go share it with people. Otherwise, it doesn't mean very much. These, these are some of the earliest memories. And I, I don't know. It's, it's just the way she was. So I, I think it embedded in me a way of thinking and learning. And then my father worked, he's retired now, he worked in the railroad industry. And um, in the 80s, the railroad industry, there were a lot of mergers uh, of companies. And so there was a lot of moving around. So I went to five different high schools in four different states. And my last year of high school, I was homeschooled. Um, and it was, a, it was great for me because what happens for, for people who have gone to different high schools in very different communities, like for example, Texas is very different from Washington State. Um, so you're not really of the group that you're learning with, um, but you're part of them and you can relate to them, but everybody kind of knows that you're not from there and you yeah. weren't raised there. And what it did for me is it turned me into an observer. So I can tell you about the differences and I can define that group in a more objective way than they can define themselves. Because when you're living with something the whole time, it's all you really know and you lose a kind of perspective. You're, you're subjective, not mm -hmm. objective. And that turned me into an observer. And by the time I got to high school, I became very interested in music and talking about my observations to other people. And when they got tired of listening to me, I would do things like write poems or songs. I've probably written 60 songs in my life and put them to music. And I, I still have all the lyrics saved and things like that. So by turning me into an observer, it made me an observer of the world. And then you try to explain the world and these were the kinds of things that would get me very excited. Um, and so I went to undergraduate school in Iowa at a wonderful small college called Morningside College. And it, I, I'm still in touch with them today. In fact, I was just there a couple of months ago to give a talk. And they gave me a place where I could really just dive into what I cared about and try to make it um, my own life's path. And around my sophomore year, which would have been 95 or so, I came upon the philosophy of an epistemologist named Karl Popper, who mm -hmm. had d just died in 1994. He was from Vienna. He's buried in Vienna. If you go to Vienna, you can find his website. In fact, if you go to his, Karl Popper's Wikipedia page, to this day, there's a photo on his Wikipedia page of his tombstone. I took it. If you zoom in, you'll see me reflected in the tombstone. I took that probably 10 years ago, and it's still there. Um, so I've made the pilgrimage, I've read every single thing he's ever written, and I know his work inside out and upside down. People today like uh, Nassim Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan and um, Anti-Fragile, and he has a uh, new book that just came out called Skin in the Game, which I haven't read yet, but I, I want to. He, he talks about skin in the game, and he even extended it to say soul in the game, which I really like are, in my view, Popperians. They, they have benefited from his work and they know the work of Popper. In fact, I've emailed with Taleb about Popper. It's been some years ago. So what Popper really tried to do was explain the behaviors of communities of scholars, scientists, of which at that time in my life, I kind of was one, but I didn't know it yet. And he, without going into a long digression here, he talked about some very interesting things that happen in scientific communities. For example, one of the things he says is, is that you can never have a true theory. No matter what your belief or your theory or your idea is, the best status it can occupy is not yet refuted. 
Mm. And he used examples from famous scholars like Isaac Newton, whose theories held sway for over 200 years. People believed that Newton had discovered God's secrets when he explained how the physical world works. But then the Einstein model came along and it explained everything that the Newtonian model could, but it also explained some things that the Newtonian model could not. For example, during an eclipse, the stars that are around the sun, when the moon passes in front of the sun, they seem to change their position in the sky. And these are, um, he, he, he had this general and specialized theories of relativity that would explain this. And he also very importantly said, and if this doesn't happen, then my theory will be proven false. This is what Popper called the falsifiability criterion. In other words, if you have an idea or a belief, if you can't articulate the conditions under which you will admit you are wrong, you're at a lower level of intellectual thinking. You have to go up to the point where you can articulate the conditions under which you will admit your theory or your idea is wrong. And if you can't do that, you need to keep working and keep thinking, keep developing your idea until you can. Now this applies in many domains of human experience. For example, um, the best investors, the best traders are the ones who when they enter a position, at that moment they understand the conditions under which they will exit that position, like a limit order or something like mm -hmm. that. They, the ones who do that tend to perform the best. So this blew my mind and it leads you into a space where you make decisions deductively meaning not inductively. So for example, if I have a theory, this is Popper's example, yeah. if I have a theory that all swans are white, I can go out to try to test that theory by observing swans in the world. And even if I observe 100 swans and they're all white, I still can't say with 100% certainty that all swans are white. white. However, if I have the theory that not all swans are white and I observe just one non-white swan, I can say with 100% certainty that not all swans are white. So the second example is, in, it's the power of deductive thinking. And he said that this is how science evolves. Scientists are actually doing that. And his, his way of thinking is the reason why we, today, we say, you, you can't say I proved a hypothesis. You can only say I failed to reject it. So his, his, his deductive approach is embedded in the way we, now this was extremely inspiring to me. Now I, I was not a normal child, but this is the kind of thing I would stay at home and get really passionate about and talk to my friends about for a very long period and, of time. And how, how old were you at this point if you're... If Sophomore in high school? I don't know, what are you, 18, 19? Wow. Something like that? Holy cow, I, I, when I was 18, 19, I was thinking about like, how do I go out partying? No, but I envied kids like you. I couldn't <laughs> hold a candle to you guys because I, I was the other kind of kid that really wanted to be, you know, talking to the girls and yeah. being with the cool guys and just being out there where uh, people were like, man, he's a, but I wasn't. I, I was more of a private sort of hero. I, I mean, when I took your class, I thought, oh my God, you must have been like one of those kids everybody wanted to hang out with and, and party with. No, but man, not at all. Not at all. I was an agreeable young person. I was polite and nice, but I, this was how I chose to spend my time. Now, he talked about scientists and I worked on thinking and I wrote papers about him. I've written songs about him. That was my thing. Now, it was a very natural leap for me to go to graduate school, which I did right out of undergrad. I entered a PhD program, the University of Illinois here in Chicago. Yeah. And um, because I was just so good at studying and all of that. But there was a point where a light bulb went off for me where I was looking at all these entrepreneurs and suddenly I saw them as scientists. I was looking at all these entrepreneurs and I saw their entrepreneurial ideas and theories as scientific theories. And then I used the Popperian approach to explaining how communities of scientists act and I extended it to explain how communities of entrepreneurs act in which people launch new ventures based on their ideas and the new ventures independently of the people who created them can compete with each other, live and die. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneur doesn't have to die but his or her venture can die. And that was an extension of Popperian thinking. That was my dissertation. And I've written a number of articles in that stream. But to answer your question about how I got into studying and working with entrepreneurs, it came from that, those early experiences of me looking at the epistemology of Karl Popper and then applying it. And to this day, I'm a Popperian. I can talk about how and what entrepreneurs do in these terms. And teach classes and give lectures and do research and do consulting projects and I even have my own side projects <coughs> to use this way of thinking for. 
And, and I think I find this very intriguing because I've never been able to, like, for example, my thought process is like always been, and you, you know this, like I started like from your class on helping Paul Flower. I hope you're successfully still going with your Chicago School of Thigh Massage because I personally have learned so much and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I've never been able to take uh, Patrick Murphy's class, ICS 394, right? So, and, and since then I've always been kind of trying to figure out what I want to do and, I, and not a lot of people get it because being an entrepreneur is completely different mindset and you're a completely different breed I feel like because you constantly are thinking about different ideas and different things. And one thing that I realized in your class that I've learned was that not a lot of people wanted to kind of take a lead on developing these things, like taking lead on leading this project and be like, oh, you can change their business this way or this way. And I, I felt like I was doing that and that led me to doing multiple things in my career. One of the things that I remember in your class and I think we kept on reconnecting was your naked pizza um, kind of project that you've taken on, which was backed by Mark Cuban. Um, and I, I would love to hear a little bit more about like, you know, how did you actually get involved into it and what were certain things that you found as, you know, an entrepreneurship scholar and were able to implement in their business to scale their business as well? Okay. In, in my experience and based on my observation over the years, one of the most important differentiators between somebody who really doubles down on the entrepreneurial path versus other paths are these individuals are more intrigued by big unanswered questions than they are by big unquestioned answers. So people who are comfortable going to sleep at night with um, a big question that's unanswered. A lot of people, I think all people are given comfort by having certainty. Mm -hmm. um, it's a human, it's an implicitly human enterprise to train yourself to be more comfortable with uncertainty. And questions have this magical power to inject uncertainty in your life because when you don't yet have the answer, you, well, you don't know what the answer is going to be. All you're doing is living with a question. By the way, the word for question in Chinese is the same word that's used for problem. And I find that very instructive and interesting because if you say, I have a problem in, in our culture, it's different than saying, I have a question. It's two different things. But there, are, there is a high context over there where there are some differences, but in terms of the literal word that's used, it, it's the same word and the same character. And I find that very interesting, and I do try to think of problems as questions. And, and so if you don't have a couple of problems in your life that you haven't worked out yet, that should make you uncomfortable. And you should have a few that you're thinking about all the time. When I worked with Naked Pizza, the three guys that started that venture had this orientation. And they had this magical combination of diversity in which one of them was this mad, crazy artist, anthropologist individual who was very interested in what people eat. He was interested in what cultures eat and communities eat going back thousands of years. So you mm. have in, in the Southwest United States a lot of corn, maybe in Cuba you have a lot of rice, in Asia and other places. And that was what he was into. And he was interested in the minerals and the contents of food that's grown in the ground some of the bacteria that's part of the food that's actually good for you, not bad for you. Mm -hmm. you. You eat good bacteria. And he had these really interesting views about how the industrialization of the food supply took out the good bacteria out of food and people would eat it. And so your internal ecosystem and your, your microbiome is imbalanced and that generates a lot of obesity and health problems. Brilliant guy, one of the most brilliant entrepreneurs I've ever met. His partner was the exact opposite. <laughs> also very smart, but a real estate entrepreneur who was, he worked from the head and he had a rational calculus for pretty much everything, everything. that he did. He never got upset. Big, strong, silent, cool type. The other guy was a hothead. It was always from here and he cared about things at a deep level. This is the kind of magic combination of the artist and the business person that I find very important in these entrepreneurial ventures. They had that to an extent that I'd never seen before. They had a third guy who I think he had used to work at one of the major pizza chains and he understood the operations of a pizza restaurant and the delivery aspects. They were the trifecta, they were fantastic. So they 
envisioned and put together this business called Naked Pizza, and all of their expertises were represented in, in the venture. They chose pizza not because they were interested in pizza. They were interested in the other things that I've already talked about. And pizza itself is not a growing industry. No. It's a huge industry, but it's not a growing industry. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you got to you got to grow your business and one way to help it grow is to put it into a context that is growing itself and that yep. helps you grow. Pizza wasn't that, but the wellness and the health industries were and are. And so by talking about good bacteria and healthy bacteria and prebiotics and probiotics and then devising a way that you could make a pizza with the, these ingredients in it and a way you could bake it without killing the living bacteria because heat tends to kill bacteria, you have this use of pizza as a vehicle for delivering good bacteria into the guts of people. And because it is not, it, it's a product that won't last a long time. The shelf life is especially low because of the bacteria. You can think about the operations and the delivery system in terms of this hyper-local strategy mm -hmm. where you put stores down and you can only deliver with a 15 minute radius. And then you think about the, uh, the, the, the building itself. Essentially, they aren't a place that really makes pizza and bakes it and they don't have dining in. The dough and the ingredients are shipped in and it's basically the, an assembly of the material through a fast oven, very quick turnover, quick delivery. It w brilliant business. So we entered a consulting competition with them. I took a team of my MBAs down to New Orleans for a consulting competition, which we won. And there were four other competitors from a lot of really famous business schools. And we're from DePaul. The reason I love my university for entrepreneurship especially is because we are very street smart. There are things that my students know that can't be taught. And the things that my students learn can be taught, and they are taught everywhere. And there's a certain kind of upward mobility that you just can't replicate that we have, that I, that I love. And it accounts for our impact and our rankings and a lot of other things. And we went down there, and I, they were so fantastic. They gave this amazing presentation, blew everybody away. And then we were on page 3A of USA Today, section A. Open the front page above the fold, a big photo of yep, us. Yep, I've right seen there. it. It's back in 2009. So that was a real um, bellwether moment for me because it turned me on to the notion that, hey, younger generations now just don't want to make money. They also want to do something that's purpose-driven and meaningful. It doesn't mean they have to go save animals and hug trees and give out soup for free mm -hmm. or give out clothes. It just means that they want to make money by doing something that's a little bit more meaningful than just making money. And that was back in 2009. So since that time, I've been intrigued by social enterprise. Not nonprofits, but social enterprise, where you have one business model generating more than one type of value, economic value, social value, natural value, whatever, but with one innovative business model. And it's a game changer. It changes the whole game. And I'm very passionate about this area. And there's, there's a lot of companies who have successfully been able to implement that. If you think about Tom's, right? Uh, Webley Parker, those are the few companies that come to my mind when you think about like, not just from a financial point of view, but also from a community point of view has been able to make an impact in this world that we live in today as well. How come there aren't that many people who are willing to take risk in today's world, but they are willing to say that you got lucky? Mm. I think a couple of things. Um, first, we're talking about a sea change here. The younger generation right now is more purpose-driven than previous generations. Um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that they have grown up w as native users of technology, information technology, socially enabled information technology. So if they have a personal interest, they can find it and research it, go down a path that's highly unique. And then when they grow up, that is embedded into their worldview as their purpose that they care about. When you look at a lot of individuals like this, they're only going to take a risk if the problem or the question in front of them is relevant to their purpose. If it's not relevant to their purpose, they're not going to care enough to take mm -hmm. a risk. And so it's not the case that they are risk averse. It's the case that that individual has not yet come upon a problem that appeals to the purpose that they care about. So part of the way that I teach is to try hard to open up the world to these individuals so that whatever their unique purpose is, they have a better chance of finding a path that they didn't know was there that would enable them to put their purpose in action. And when people have a way to pursue their purpose, they'll risk a lot. Like if something's important to you, for example, if you're, if you're dating somebody, let's say, this is a forgive the crude example, but I use it with undergrads and it tends to work. Um, 
and you go out and you're just meeting a person, you really like them and you think, man, that may be the one for me. And you're in a social setting and somebody else maybe starts talking to that individual in a way that disrespects you and then maybe even takes it a little bit further. And that person would, you would never confront that person in a normal situation. But you might do it in that situation because what's at stake comes from here. People will be incredibly brave if what they are carrying with them as one of the defining features of their existence is at stake. Okay? Now, it doesn't just have to be a personal relationship. It can be a family member or a child mm -hmm. or a pet. Entrepreneurs feel that way about their idea. And when they do, they will take what looks like to other people big risks. But to them, they're ice cold, cool. They're not afraid. Now, after they do it, they might look back on it and say, oh, man, what was I thinking? <laughs> I could have really been hurt. Or they might look, but that's sort of after the fact kind uh -huh. of uh, sense making, not in the moment. So I think the purpose-driven nature is a big part of why we don't see a lot of people taking risks. They just haven't found that one thing that opens them up yet. But I don't think a lot of people do explore themselves either, right? Like, for example, I know because over the years we've been connected and continue to stay connected is I know that you speak more than one language. I know you travel to China and Japan and you live there as well. And, and I, I feel like a lot of people are just this. They're just, they, they're just narrow into their templated lifestyle where there are certain people like yourself who are like this, who are like, let me just see what else is out there. Let me explore. And, and when I came to you to meet last time just to catch up, uh, and you blew me away and I was like, holy f like you, you have two horses now and you will teach entrepreneurship. And I was like, how does somebody go from teaching entrepreneurship at a university and doing consulting for big brands like Naked Pizza and now is dominating or somewhat uh, getting to a level where it's like, I have two horses. It's like I said earlier, it started at an early age, but that's no reason why anybody can't do that. I think this is the role of a good education in society. As an educator and as a professor, and I, I believe in this strongly, you have to open up new possibilities. Uh, and I do that in the form of posing new questions to individuals to make them redefine how they view the world and go seeking for that opportunity, even before they know it exists, that's going to connect with them. I've had the benefit of working in a university, in an academic environment where I see a lot of this and do a lot of this. So it, it, it has influenced mm -hmm. me. And in, in the case of the racehorses, as you mentioned, um, I'm an animal lover. I, I believe animals ennoble people. I believe animals have very admirable traits, such as they don't engage and wallow in self-pity if they're injured. You see a dog with three legs, it's not feeling sorry for itself. And even though it may not know how to feel sorry for itself, that is still something we can learn from. And I've, I'm a big animal lover, and that uh, through circumstances, I became aware of horse racing, and I met some people, and I uncovered some new questions, and I met some individuals and trainers and owners, and I, I'm a history buff. And this is a very old industry, and I've, I've read a lot of books, watched a lot of documentaries, and traveled to a lot of places to learn about it, including in Dubai, where they have an amazing racetrack called Maidan, amazing horse racing facility. And that has been my thing. It's probably a midlife crisis. Um, you know, you, you're going to get to a point in your life, probably in your 40s, where you've kind of arrived enough to have the means to do certain things and the time, but you still have enough of your youthful vigor that you might want to venture in a few unexpected ways. And it's a great time to jump into something but like I don't, this. But I don't, I feel like, maybe it's just me that's surrounded by people, but you know, it's, you, it, there's a saying that you, you are the five people that you're surrounded by, you know? And I feel like I, I don't see that a lot, lot often nowadays. Like, I don't see somebody saying, you know what, I'm going to go learn something new. It doesn't matter if it's they're interested or not. Like, I know so many people who are like, man, I love basketball. But I know, I can tell you that they probably have not spent reading books, watching documentary or something, learning the ins and outs of basketball. So therefore, they're even so much more engaging than they can tell their kids or they can tell their niece and nephew who are into sports. And, and you are like just a machine, I feel like. It's like you, you taught me that day. I literally left your office and I was like, holy shit. 
like I did not even know about the Sagittarius, the horse itself. And next day I made a post about it I, and I shared it with you. And I opened my eyes up to completely new thing that I didn't even know that, that like I was, I could connect to. I think a lot of times society at a macro level is geared to put individuals and communities and families into stable situations that last. That's an important part of civilized society, and it is a kind of status quo that we begin with if we want to grow. The way that you begin with it and grow out of it is through curiosity. Curiosity is a superpower. It's the cure for boredom. It's the cure for stability. It's the cure for solving problems that you can't seem to solve. It just resolves a lot of things, and the ingredient of curiosity is questions. For these individuals who love basketball and they're into it or whatnot, I could imagine having a really interesting conversation with somebody like that, but I'd be asking them a lot of questions. Why do you like basketball? Why are the floors made out of wood? Why did the shorts used to be shorter than they are today? And if they can't answer those, I would try to put it to them in a way that would make them wonder, well, yeah, why is that? And that can sometimes take somebody down a road where they'll go into something like flooring or athletic garments and suddenly decide they want to be an entrepreneur in one of those two areas because it started with a love of basketball. But you're not going to get there without asking a question that hooks their mind to think in a particular way that can take them in an unexpected direction. I think a lot of times when we see people, they're living with answers and they're comfortable with the stability of it, but they're not living with questions that can put them into a out of their comfort zone into a realm where they're a little bit uncomfortable because they don't have the question answered yet and then they move to try to answer it and it can take them and their career in an unexpected direction. So I, when I see all these individuals that you're talking about and I see them too, I view it as a question. What can I do to change that? And a lot of times it's just putting them, putting questions to them that excite them enough to take them out of the path that they're currently on. I'm a professor, so that's a lot of what I do. But um, when you asked me that question, that's what it made me think of. Mm. And then in terms of um, entrepreneur, right? Do you think a person is born as an entrepreneur or they figure out as they're trying to navigate themselves into their career and life and said, holy cow, like I need to start my own business and I cannot work? Everybody is born with the potential. It's a lot of people are, need to be disillusioned from the fact that in popular press magazines and books, the narrative seems to be, here are the 10 traits of an entrepreneur. If you have these, you have the right stuff, maybe, to be. There's a kind of subtle belief out there that that's the case. I reject that belief. I do not believe in it. This is the kind of thing that back in the 1940s and 50s, when people had conversations about what makes a great leader, these are the kinds of things they would say. Here are the 10 qualities of a great leader, and if you have these traits, you'll be a leader in whatever situation. That's been debunked, and I think the same argument is in the process of being debunked for entrepreneurs. Everybody's born with a unique potential. The diversity across types of people is incredible. The diversity across what different types of people care about is incredible, and embedded in that diversity are, is an infinite range of potential paths that people can take if their constellation of gifts and talents is aligned with the right problem in front of them. It's the match between what people are born with, with something about the world that they can connect it with. There are people right now on the south side of Chicago with more musical talent than Beethoven or Mozart, but the world will never know because that collection of potential is never going to be set in front of the right environment with a piano and a teacher to bring it out. And when I say entrepreneurs are born, that's what I mean. The potential is there. It's necessary but not sufficient. The challenge is to connect that potential with a path that will allow it to be activated. And when people behave in accordance with their gifts, they can outwork everybody else. They can work twice as much without being stressed because, again, it's rejuvenative and therapeutic to behave in that way. And they can be trained, though. I don't want to say that it's all inborn potential and then mm -hmm. just a matter of finding what you should find. I think the spark of curiosity and questions, and when people ask, you know, when, when you know, the old philosophers would say the unexamined life is not worth living, that's 
what they meant. You have to ask, why am I here? What am I better at than anybody else? And live with that question for a while. And eventually the world will reward you with an answer and then you can try to pursue it. And then at that point, there, there are a lot of things one can learn. For example, I find that people are not born with the ability to be able to think about growth. It's just not something that we are hardwired to think about. We do grow, and perhaps that's why we don't understand it. When you think of yourself as a kid, you, you actually don't know how small you were when you were a kid until you go back to your kindergarten and look at the chairs, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're subjected to this experience, so you're subjective about it and not objective. And entrepreneurship is not entrepreneurship if it doesn't involve growth. You're gonna grow your resources, you're gonna grow your time, you're gonna grow your physical presence, you're gonna grow your team everything that you do, your impact. And you know, the example I use when I teach, you may remember, is that if I take a piece of paper and fold it in half, the thin piece of paper has just become twice as thick, but it's still thin. And if I fold it again, it's four times as thick. And then again, it's eight times as thick, but it's still thin. And so the question is, how many times would we need to double that piece of paper before it's thick enough to reach from here to the moon? It's an empirical question. There's an answer there. Um, but it's very hard for people to answer. People will say infinity. People will say a million. People will you know, throw out all these numbers all over the board. And that's my point. Because there's such a variation in what people will say as a, as a concrete number to that, it's because people don't understand growth very well. But then when I tell them the answer, mm -hmm. which is about 44, they're surprised by that. And again, that's my point. People aren't good at thinking about growth. And if you don't get that your idea or your impact or your history or your money can grow on that order, on the same order, the same curve, you need to get your head into the game and think in those terms because exponential growth does apply to what you might want to do in that way. And if it takes off, it will apply. So the challenge is how do I lead in that context knowing that I might be 100 times as big five years from now Try to imagine yourself in that realm. And by talking a lot about this and, and explaining the logic of growth and the waste and the error that comes with it, I can teach young people how to scale their business, or old people for that matter. I can teach anybody how to scale their business in a more intelligent way than people who don't have those lessons. So there is some educational component, but that's just the, the structure around it. Inside of that, there's a potentiality that people are born with and is put into that growth context and then people can scale things around it. The only other thing I'll add is that nothing grows without generating waste. In the biological world, they say waste is food. Trees shed their leaves, snakes shed their skin, children grow out of their clothes. The challenge in the, in the natural world is how to recycle waste. Put the clothes on another kid as a hand-me-down. Yeah. The leaves generate fertilizer for things that grow on the forest floor, so on and so forth. Um, it changes the way we think about error and mistakes if you really get into the growth-oriented entrepreneurial mindset because now if you can put boundaries around the costs associated with error, we can use error as a discovery engine for more growth and more abundance. The industrial organizational paradigm and the bureau bureaucracy and the bureaucratic form is geared for efficiency, output divided by input. It eliminates waste. In the entrepreneurial realm, we, we, we don't eliminate waste. We just put boundaries around it without eliminating it. I'm going to let that all sink in for a little hot minute. <laughs> that, that, but besides that, I, I, I first of all, like, I think the knowledge that you just shredded, I think, as everybody in this room probably can relate to, is like at a different caliber and different mindset that you bring in. Um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on and to, well, first of all, I think there's something that you said, which is I totally agree with, with you on, is that as human, we've been given the power of imagination, right? So as, as, as you want to start thinking how you're going to grow and as you start imagining, and I believe that universe, as, that, as long as you put in the right work, as long as you do the work, I think the universe figures out a way to bring it to you. Um, and then second thing is, right, as an entrepreneur, right, I am... So the show is called Staying Uncomfortable, right? It's, it's all about like doing things that are outside your comfort zone. So therefore you experience life more, you experience the growth and you connect with life and you have enjoyable life and you are able to relate to a lot of things, right? But in that process, you also go on cloud nine and then 
you come back on the ground and sitting here finding yourself in the corner and trying to figure out why am I even doing this when I can just go out and get a job and become just a normal human being just like everybody else why do you think that that pattern exists in entrepreneurs right because entrepreneurship is an implicitly human act if you really think about what the entrepreneur does by envisioning something that nobody else knows about and then trying to turn that vision into an idea or a project that engages a problem that everybody knows about. So starting with something nobody knows about and going to something everybody or a lot of people know about and making that magical connection, it's not really something as so far as we know that other living things on this planet do. They do organize, but it's a much more instinctive or tribal way. And even if you break it down, to the most basic of all organisms, the amoeba living on the ocean floor, a unicellular organism that has been there for millions of years. The reason it has remained a unicellular organism is because it stays in its comfort zone. It stays within the right temperature, and if it moves out of that temperature toward too hot or too cold, it moves back into just right, and it stays in its comfort zone. It avoids its zone of un discomfort. That is why it hasn't evolved. When you talk about people with curiosity and questions, we are socialized through the magic of whatever has made us what we are to being intrigued by that realm where it's a little too hot or a little too cold. And we find a way to survive there. And in so doing, in so correcting the mismatch between what we are and what exists, we grow. And our ideas that we use to help us make that journey those grow and evolve too. And I think a lot of times that's what entrepreneurs are doing at the heart of everything. It's just in a business context. The difference between amoeba and entrepreneur is getting out of your comfort zone. Um, unicellular organism versus a human being. In my view, the only difference is that the latter is more interested in things that it does not know and it's uncomfortable with and it doesn't avoid them. You know, if if you're living in a world where <clears throat> you're surrounded by uncertainty, we are geared, we are built to fall back onto what we truly are. When people are put into uncertain environments, that's when you find out what they're really made of. Um, if they're a negotiator, they'll try to negotiate. If they're a fighter, they'll try to fight. If they're a fleer, they'll try to run. Whatever it is, when people are in uncertainty, that's when they tend to do what is actually natural to them and, and how they're built. That's why with entrepreneurs, they're in an environment where they've found a way to behave in accordance with who they are way down deep. Um, but it's unclear to them what that's going to generate. But they believe enough in who they are. How could they not believe in who they are? They have to believe in who they are because it's how they're constructed to view the world. When you're behaving in relation to that, you don't have to prepare. You just act. And if you're doubting that, if you don't feel that, in other words, if you have to think twice as an entrepreneur, you probably shouldn't do it. In the same way that if you're in a radically uncertain environment and you don't think, you act naturally, you don't doubt that. You do it. And there's a certain kind of truth to that level of action that if the entrepreneur is in fact able to dig down into their values and embed those values in their work, it's unassailable, it's unquestionable, they're not afraid to do it, and other people can't copy it because who you are is, as we say, unique. And if you're able to put what you are into your work, not only is it bold and rejuvenating and therapeutic, other people can't copy it, it's inimitable.